Welcome to the latest edition of Circling the Bases. I'm DJ Short, and with me here once again is Scott Pianowski from Yahoo. Thanks to those of you watching on Twitch right now, and for those of you listening in podcast form or watching later on YouTube or recording on Wednesday. We took off Monday for Memorial Day, but baseball never stops. That's why we're back here for our usual Waiver Wire Wednesday show. Scott and I will each give some recommendations off the waiver wire, ranging from shallow leagues to deeper formats, something for everyone, hopefully. So, Scott, it's been a week since uh, we've had a show. How are you doing? Doing great. Weather is heating up in Michigan. The fantasy pennant races are heating up. We're just about ready to turn the calendar to June. So, look, I, I think it's, it's been a few weeks past this, but now you should have a sense of what you're doing here. Are you contending? If you're in a keeper league, are you playing for next year. You know, what do you need? What are the, what's the personality of the categories? Where are you deep? What can you trade from easily? What can you go out and get? So this is really a good time to take stock. Look at, look around the league, right? And see, oh, this guy's 15 stolen bases ahead of everybody else, or oh, this guy has 11 more saves than anybody else, or maybe you're that team, and try to evaluate. Now you can really pinpoint where do I need help and what is it? Where is it easy to trade? Sometimes you can make it a trade very easily because I have an excess of something. You have an excess of something. And also, I know you can be nervous sometimes. I don't want to trade a good player. He's going to come back and hurt me. Well, trade that good player to the 10th place team, right? Trade him to somebody who can't hurt you or somebody who maybe can't hurt you in the category. You may even trade a player to a team that can hurt your opponent in a key category. So a yeah. good time to take stock. We're about a little over a quarter through the season. Just a good sense of – get a sense of where you are in the, in the categories, where you are in the standings. And what is your objective for the next maybe quarter of the season as we get to the All-Star break? Yeah, I mean, Memorial Day traditionally has been that, you know, first benchmark of the season where you start to look at the standings and just in baseball in general and say, huh, you know, you start to get a sense of who's for real and who's not, who could be trading some players at the deadline, all that kind of stuff. And that's stuff you should pay attention to from a fantasy perspective, too, like. Yeah, you, know, you take a look at the White Sox and how disappointing they have been. Can they really dig themselves out? Uh, are they going to be trading Lucas Giolito? I mean, I feel like this is stuff all fantasy managers should be thinking about and what the repercussions of those uh, situations uh, could be. So always an important time of year for sure. Um, I'm not going to mention this player in today's show, but I do think we need to talk about him for a second. Uh, Ellie De La Cruz, the top prospect with the Reds, he was, I guess, made some indication on his social media over the past couple of days that maybe he's close to getting a call up. Uh, there was an article in The Athletic kind of talking about, um, you know, where Jonathan India fits into this team once all their prospects come up. And Carnacion Strand is in that mix, too. We've seen Matt McLean be called up recently. Spencer Steers there. A lot of potential moving pieces, but obviously the Reds are talking about it. Ellie De, Ellie De La Cruz is, you know, a stat cast uh, darling in the making. Um, and he's still out there in more than 50% of Yahoo leagues. That probably shouldn't be the case. Would you recommend picking him up everywhere? Yeah, immediately. He's not just a stat cast darling. He's a stat darling. Look at his AAA numbers at Louisville, 304, 401, 659, 11 home runs. 11 stolen bases. He has been caught six times, although he was a high percentage base stealer before this season. And maybe the most important thing is he's only 21 years old. So he's young for the level. It's, it's one thing if he was like maybe a little bit older, you wouldn't be as impressed. And he's always had the pedigree of you know, one of the best hitters in the minor leagues. Yeah, he's somebody, nothing's guaranteed. Baseball is hard, but because there's so much plausible upside, I would try to grab him anywhere I could. Yeah, we're right in that like <coughs> between quarter to a third of the way through this season. So, you know, maybe if you've underperformed till until this point, there's certain there's certainly still hope. And there's hope with a player like De La Cruz uh, to get you over the hump, you know, as far as power and speed, the ballpark, a lot uh, working in his favor. Like you said, nothing's guaranteed. But uh, when I think about the players and the minors currently who can come up and make a big impact the rest of the way, he's far and away the top option. And plus um, maybe, maybe a couple of weeks ago, you picked up Brian De La Cruz. So you can run a double De La Cruz at your opponents. <laughs> uh, he's having, not much has gone right. right in Miami, although obviously Jorge Soler is hitting a home run just about every other day. It feels like, but uh, De La Cruz yeah. has popped as well. So maybe you can run a couple of De La Cruz's at your opponents. And also you mentioned, it's not clear where India is going to slot. 
India has been such a, I wouldn't worry if you're a Jonathan India yeah. manager. He's so good. He's going to play somewhere. It's just a matter of yeah. where he's been. I thought before the season that the Reds had some sneaky fantasy value as an overall lineup. For the most part, that's been false. India has been really the only obvious ADP winner. I mean, Spencer Steer's been okay. There's been moments from Nick Senzel. Or Fraley. Like, more of a tease than usual. Yeah, Fraley's been pretty good. Stevenson hasn't killed you. I think he's been just maybe an eyelash of a disappointment. I would still trust Stevenson the rest of the way. But Jonathan yep. India right now is the kingpin of this offense. He's going to be playing somewhere. Yeah, no doubt about that. No doubt about that. But just that it's even being talked about internally with the Reds just tells you how close – uh de la cruz is to making his debut so keep an eye on that stash him now i think it could be any day that we see him uh so keep that in mind and if you want to keep track of the latest news you should download the roto world app uh stay ahead of the competition by favoriting players on your roster get the latest injury updates player news and much more delivered right to your phone it's available in your app store today and if you favorite Ellie De La Cruz, you will get uh, most likely a push message when he's called up to the major. So you'll know right away as soon as he's called up, which will be a lot of fun. And we definitely look forward to that. Yeah. And also, uh, producer Adam points out that De La Cruz is plus 1600 to win Rookie of the Year in BetMGM. He's the fourth mm. shortest price on the board, despite having no major league experience yet. Corbin That's Carroll wild. Is, is a big favorite at plus 130. And I, I'm not saying he's necessarily bet on De La Cruz, but it just reflects that how much ceiling this player has. And, and that's what you're looking at, right? Because, again, baseball's hard. Anybody can come up. Mike Trout, famously, his first go around in the majors was not successful. And then he <laughs> kind of figured it out since then. Yeah. But you're just looking for a player who can explode, who can maybe, you know, a month later, but, oh, my God, he's, he's like been like a top 15 hitter the last month. And De La Cruz is that type of player. And, because he has the power speed combo, even if he doesn't hit for a great average right away, I, thought, I, I think it's certainly possible that he might. I would think the power and the speed would play right away. Yeah, Francisco Alvarez has really picked it up for the Mets recently. He's looked really, really impressive with the power. I'm not striking out really either. I think his strikeout rate has been around 18, 9 per, 18 or 19 percent over the past 30 days, which you love to see from a, from a young player, of course. He's been better defensively than I thought he would be, or at least what the reputation was. Uh, so I've been impressed with that. I mean, he could certainly hit as a rookie of the year type of player. Brett Beatty has been a little up and down, but he's still capable of being in that mix too. But I've been extremely impressed by Alvarez and recently moved up to the number two spot in the Mets lineup, which is huge too, fantasy-wise. Right, and he's getting respect also, as, as Adam points <clears throat> out. Uh, he's plus 600, Alvarez is, in the nice. rookie of the year prices over at Bet MGM. So shows how much he's climbed. What, what a weird season for the Mets. I, I wish I could figure out Cody yeah. Senga, right? When I trust him, he gets hit. When I don't trust him, all of a sudden he's all Cy right, Young yeah. again. He was unhittable Tuesday with a one hit, nine strikeouts. Yeah. And you make the great point with Alvarez. His defense has actually been fine. I was worried when he came up, and then he had that Sunday game against the Marlins where they ran wild on him. I was like, oh, I don't want the Mets to have a reason not to play this guy. He's hitting so well, yeah. and his defense has been perfectly adequate. He should be in the lineup, you know, 70, 80 percent of the time. And right now, it seems like he has that real estate. No doubt, no doubt. So let's get into these waiver wire recommendations. And last week was your turn on our pitch clock. This week it's my turn. So I sent you a list of five players I intended to talk about today, and you're going to pick one at random to throw at me. So, so who we got, Scott? Let's do it. Well, you've had a couple of years to come up with your Michael Soroka case. He was really interesting when he first came up with the Braves. And then as the pitchers often do, he came into some injuries. It's been a while. He's back in the majors. So uh, give us your best 40 seconds on Soroka. Yeah, so he is currently available in 54% of Yahoo leagues. Of course, two tears of his right Achilles tendon. So it's been over a thousand days before he made his return to the majors this week. And he, he was pretty good. He gave up four runs. Uh, struck out three, walked two. What I like was seeing the velocity up from what we've seen in the past. He's added some mass to his frame. Uh, and remember when he originally came up, he was probably a number two type fantasy starter, more about control than strikeout. So I like seeing the increase in velocity. Uh, the results more recently in AAA were pretty good. I still not counting on a lot of strikeouts, but having that Braves lineup backing him, I think is good for wins. And I think eventually Max Reed will be back and the Braves will have a decision to make. But I think Soroka is a guy you're probably going to go 
start to start, see the matchups, whatever it may be. But the pedigree that he has, still very young. Uh, I'm I'm advocating a pickup, but I think it's some somewhat wait and see. Right. At least he has the support of the Atlanta infrastructure, right? That great lineup, probably the best team in the National League. So when he was healthy, when he first came up, he was one of my favorite guys to watch because always yep. around the strike zone. You know, the, the yep. guys – I like pitchers who throw strikes and the trade off with guys who are strike throwers. A lot of times they allow a fair amount of home runs. You think of like Aaron Nola, he's always around the plate. You could argue maybe Aaron Nola throws too many strikes. And I would think maybe that's, that's if Soroka really got it back together, maybe that's like the high end of his range. He could be like an Aaron Nola type where he's not dynamic in the strikeout category. We will contribute, yeah. but certainly plausible upside applies to Soroka. And I'm, I'm looking forward just, just nice to have Mike Soroka back in our orbit. No doubt. I'm going to cheat with my first pickup because it's supposed to be a 50% uh, threshold for talking about somebody. And Zach McKinstry of the Tigers has crept over that. Of course, we didn't talk on Monday. And I was going to talk all about McKinstry and how I picked him up everywhere I could in our fab segment. Had we done one on Monday, it was obviously Memorial Day. So I'm going to cheat as I do. Hopefully the uh, you know, the baseball uh, Rob Manfred won't throw a suspension at me for cheating because he is over 50%. But what do you get from McKinstry? Right, Four positions of eligibility. He's batting leadoff just about every day for the Tigers. He's already scored a run, hit a run prop on McKintree on Wednesday afternoon. 296, 406, 441. I realize that slash line doesn't is not at all congruent with the, what he's done for his career. He's been a journeyman. He really hasn't hit anywhere. He didn't hit for the Dodgers, didn't hit for the Cubs. Maybe he just needed to get back to the Midwest. He's an Ohio kid. He went to Central Michigan. The walk, the plate discipline is a real stat is a real skill that he has. He's running like crazy. He's not powerless. He's hit a handful of home runs. And I love the four positions of eligibility. Yeah, yes. Has he yep. pushed over 50%? Yes. Is is there no floor here? Absolutely. Because the guy's got no track record really until this season. But I think he should go up to 70 80%. And I would not be at all surprised if he bets leadoff for this team the rest of the season. I mean, I could see that too, uh, just with the talent pool there. Uh so, yeah, I like the volume at the top. Multi-position eligibility is nice. Riley Green is hurt on the Tigers now. Uh, I think it's a, a fibula injury, right? Sounds a fracture, a right. uh, hairline fracture in the fibula. So that could be a little while. So uh, that might help the case for playing time, too. So that's unfortunate, but potentially working in his favor. I'm actually going to cheat with my next pick, too, and say Adam Duvall. So... He's, uh, he's already rostered more than 50% of Yahoo leagues, but maybe somebody you forgot about a little bit. So got off to a red hot start, was hitting 455 with four home runs and 14 RBIs. That was through the first week of the season, first eight games, then broke his wrist. But he just started a minor league rehab assignment in AAA on Tuesday. He's not eligible to return from the 60-day IL until June 9th. So you're going to have to wait a uh, week, 10 days. A week and a half or so before he'll be eligible to return. But uh, I, I would think he'll be ready right at that time and has the chance to mash. I, I wouldn't say, you know, on the level that he was doing to start the year. Uh, and certainly with a wrist injury, you wonder about the power and that sort of thing. But um, in that ballpark, in that lineup, with the history that he has as being a, a power producer. Uh, if you're in a shallow league and, you know, someone dropped him, like let's say they had too many injuries they had to drop Duvall, I think you should pick him up immediately, uh, stash him if you have an open IL spot because he has a chance to be a good value the rest of the way. Yeah, my, I talked about earl, earlier episode, one of my favorite trivia questions, who led the National League in RBIs in 2021? It was Duvall, a very screen season because he split it between Miami and Atlanta, drove in 68 yeah. runs for the Marlins and 45 with the Braves. He's had a 33 homer season before. He's gone over 100 RBIs a few, a couple different times. He had 99 RBI season with the Reds too. You plunk him into Fenway Park. I don't need to sell anybody on that. So if he's healthy, he I know his career average is 233. You have to manage expectations on that. But I mean, a healthy Duvall is a 30 100 guy right out of the box. Yeah. I want him anywhere I can get him, and I'll make up for the average elsewhere. You may have to make up for the average if you pick up Willie Castro. Although I think you should consider it anyway. Four positions of eligibility for the Twins. This is a team that doesn't want to run, but they're letting Castro run. He's got three stolen bases in his last five games. He's got some power. He'll probably hit double-digit home runs by the end of the season. He's got a horrible approach. He's not going to walk. And this is a player that you have to accept sometimes that some players are more valuable in fantasy than they are in reality. Willie Castro is one of those guys. Again, he 
plays different to the Twins ethos. They don't really want to run, but they're letting Castro run. He's got a little bit of pop. He's flexible. Yeah, there's going to be some week if you play Castro, he's going to go two for 25. He's just that sure. type of player with all the swing and miss in his game. But the category juice plays, the positions play. I did pick up Castro in a few leagues over the weekend. So this is another shallow-ish league play for me. Jake McCarthy uh, with the Diamondbacks, available in 50% of Yahoo leagues. Again, just another guy you might have forgot about. Uh, was really struggling to begin the year. Hit 143 with a 467 OPS. Over 22 games before being demoted in late April. Hit well in AAA. Yes, Pacific Coast League, but... Here he is since coming back, 5 for 14 uh, with a double. So 357 over his first five games since coming back. This was a player at a breakout year last year. Hit 283, eight home runs, 23 stolen bases over 99 games. Did he figure something out in AAA? Did it just get his confidence going again? Like, we'll see. But I think it's worth taking a chance on McCarthy uh, that he has some better uh, results this time around. Sure. He, he's one of those guys who just feels like whenever he's on base, he wants to run. Arizona's fine with that. And I, I, I think you have a type, right? You have the Soroka comeback. You have the Duvall comeback. You have the Jake McCarthy comeback. So all your pickups are kind of fitting a similar theme there. Maybe I have a type, but just guys who kind of come out of nowhere, like McKinstry fits that label. And Ben Lively of the Reds fits that mm-hmm. label. He's been a journeyman, right? I mean, he's been somebody yep. who... 4.35 career ERA, 1.36 whip. Why would you want somebody like that? Well, they plunked him down into the Reds rotation, and he's had three good starts in a row. He's got 22 strikeouts against five walks. That always plays. I'm, I'm just going to see where this goes. I, the Reds, I know the ballpark isn't ideal, but that division has plenty of soft landing spots. There's really no team in the NL Central that concerns me. I know that the divisional play isn't as heavy as it used to be, but pitching, I don't know about you, DJ. I've had a lot of difficulty finding – trustable, credible starting pitchers yeah, yeah. off the waiver wire I could play. So when Lively, again, 31-year-old guy, he's bounced around. He hasn't even pitched in the majors since 2019. When he shows up with three decent starts, I don't think we can ignore it out of hand. I've added him in a few. I even had him for some of the some of my leagues at Boston. I mean, that's how desperate some of my teams were. I threw him into to the Wolves against uh, the Red Sox at Fenway Park, and I got five and two-thirds, four, zero, zero, two, six. Uh, yeah, okay, that's a win. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, speaking of the NL Central, you just mentioned Ben Lively on the Reds. Sunday morning means MLB leadoff. Watch exclusive live games all season long on Peacock. This week, check out an NL Central battle between the Cardinals and the Pirates in Pittsburgh. Catch the action live this Sunday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern. The Pirates have had a bad month of May. We're, we're almost... Yeah, tomorrow's June 1st, so May's pretty much done. The Pirates have had a really bad month after an amazing start to the season. The Cardinals have turned things around uh, more recently, and I think when it's all said and done, they'll be right there in the NL Central. But I believe the Pirates are still just one game out, so they're very much in the mix as well. Yeah, that that division is crazy, right? I mean, you both yeah. of the Centrals really... If I look at the NL Central standings right now, Pittsburgh is just one game out. Top to bottom, there's only four and a half games separating the first place Brewers from the last place Cardinals. Yeah. And the Brewers are the only team over 500, and they're a whopping 28 26. And the AL Central is very similar, where Minnesota, despite being just 28 27, they're in first place. And Detroit, Cleveland, and Chicago could all tell themselves a story. They're all in the race. The White Sox, as bad as their season has been, they're only six games out. I mean, that yeah. You have a hot two weeks that could be in first place. I still think the Guardians have the best roster in that division, but nobody's running anywhere. I, it's just nice to see Detroit in quasi-contention, even though yeah. um, I don't know where they're going. They just lost Eduardo Rodriguez for a while, who's the, right. their best starting pitcher. That's going to be a big hit. But yeah. the Central Division is a lot of uh, – look. I, I still think at the end of the day, give, I'm going to take the Guardians, and I'm going to take the Cardinals to win the two Central Divisions. Who Me would too. you pick right now? Uh I think the Twins are the best team right now. Uh, they did get Royce Lewis back. I would say out of any of those teams, the central teams, I think the Twins are the best team. The Guardians have to hit. I mean, they can pitch all day. I'm about to mention one of them here. Uh, but they can't They can't hit. They just can't hit. Andres Jimenez has been a huge disappointment so far. Stephen Kwan is, hasn't quite backed up what he did last year. Josh Bell has been a huge disappointment. Like They're just – they don't hit enough. I mean, period. They just do not. I, I think they, going into the year, I thought they were the most talented team. But what the Twins have done with their pitching, adding Louis Barlin to the mix here, uh, Royce Lewis is back, 
uh, another comeback type of player we mentioned in one of our recent episodes. Um, and he was he was great in his season debut for the Twins, hitting a homer, a game time sing, game tying single. He should be rostered everywhere. But I, I think the Twins have more juice. Uh, yeah, you, you may be right team. on that. I guess I, maybe I had underestimated. Cleveland scored 188 runs. To put that in perspective, I mean, that's that's dead last. They're even 10 runs behind the Oakland A's, who it feels like they yeah. have like two or three hitters that are okay, and then six dead spots. And you know, being watched by 8,000 fans or 6,500 fans who are all you know, making fun of the ownership for what a clown car that team has become really sad. Yeah. A's minus 193 in the run differential. That That's really difficult to do. So yeah. I, I can see the case for the Twins. So they, they have they built a pretty good team there. Um, and they have maybe more depth. They don't have an obvious weakness, right? They have a little bit of power. They have a good rotation. They have some good options in the bullpen. They've kept Buxton on the field, which is – you know, I guess DH is what he's going to be now, which he's even running. He's still picking his spots. Buxton's still one of the highest yeah. percentage base deals. Was, was it the highest percentage base deal of all time when we talked about that? I, yes, last week. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So um, I teed you up for the Guardians. Uh, we do know they do have a decent pitching staff. That's the only reason they haven't gotten buried by 10 feet of snow in that division. You see True. an opportunity to buy one of their pitchers. Yeah, Logan Allen. So available in 66% of Yahoo leagues, despite an amazing start Monday against the Orioles, uh, struck out 10 batters over seven scoreless innings. Usually when there's a start like that, you see someone get picked up everywhere. For some reason, Allen has not been. Despite having a 272 ERA across his first seven starts in the majors, the strikeouts, he has a couple double-digit strikeout games so far if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but two really big strikeout games for the most part has been around like five strikeouts, but hasn't walked more than two batters in any start thus far. Uh, so I don't think we're seeing a lot of smoke and mirrors here. Uh, his fielding independent pitching is a little bit higher. His XERA is a little bit higher, but he's a really good pitcher. Not someone who's going to blow you away, which we knew coming in when he was called up, but uh, very good in terms of uh you know, spotting his pitches, sequencing, command, all that. He checks all those boxes. Tristan McKenzie's on his way back. We know that. Tanner Bybee has looked good as well. So is there a log jam of starting pitching in this rotation eventually? Maybe, but I think Allen is just making this case that he has to stay, and maybe Cal Quantrill goes to the bullpen. We'll see what happens, but I think at least in the short term, Allen, I just don't understand why he's not rostered more than 50% of Yahoo leagues. Just when you were saying, it's hard to find these type of like arms you're going to trust. Rookies, it's hard to trust from start to start. Granted that, but that the the results have been outstanding, and I don't think it's it's phony in any way. I agree. Bet, bet on the talent, and don't worry necessarily about where his rotation spot is going to be. And as you mentioned, Quantrill could be on thin ice. He got bombed earlier this week, seven or eight runs. I forget exact damage. He was on a couple of my teams. I, even though Cal Quantrill has such a low ceiling. I did have him rostered somewhere because it's hard to find quality starting pitching. I don't understand Allen's roster ship tag right now. I think people need to get to fixing that. You know, DJ, you talk about things you wanted to know before the season. I'd like to go back and tap myself on the shoulder in March and say, look, just get all the Rays and get all the Texas Rangers because they're going to be absolute juggernauts. And maybe the Rays I could have come up with, but who expected through, I guess I say quarter of the season, we're, we're actually a third of the season through right. now. Just about everybody has played in that mid 50s. 54 is the one third point of the season. And they're the Texas Rangers, 344 runs. They're ahead of everybody. They actually have the best run differential in the American League as well. So any path to this offense has me interested. It includes Leody Tavares. I know he's batting ninth, but. 310 average. I still think he's only stolen a handful of bases, but I still think he's somebody over a full season who could maybe still 25. He does have a little yeah. bit of power. And maybe they're certainly not going to bench Simeon or Seager or lower those guys. But maybe if one of those guys got hurt, maybe Tavares could get some better lineup real estate. But even in the bottom of this lineup, it's the best lineup in baseball. All in mm-hmm. the Universal DH now, you don't have to worry about going to the National League and losing a spot. I, I just want any way into this offense, even if I take somebody batting at the bottom of the order. Yeah, and you look at Tavares, like he's he's pulled the strikeout rate down from what we've seen over the past couple of years. Two years ago, it was 32.4%. Last year, it was 25.8%. This year, down to 21.1%. Has the speed in his favor. I be, He is 95th percentile for sprint speed, so that helps as far as his batting average on balls in play. His expected batting average is 283, so 
Uh, generally, with these kind of players, you see off to a hot start, you'd think like, oh, his batting on John Mollison plays probably like 400 or something. But, I mean, he's earned what he's done until this point, which is very encouraging. And just to get a piece of a, a quality lineup. So uh, I'm in on that as well. And I also want to talk about another Ranger uh, who snuck up on me because I, I didn't really know a lot about this pitcher until his debut, but it was so impressive. And I have to talk about Grant Anderson just being added to the system at Yahoo. So available in nearly all leagues at the moment. Very funky reliever, 25 years old, had a good year in the minors last year. We're talking strictly relief here, but backed it up so far this season in double A and triple A, 354 ERA, 47 strikeouts, 11 walks over 28 innings. Made his debut Tuesday against the Tigers. One hit with seven strikeouts in two and two thirds innings, seven whiffs, 13 called strikes in 46 pitches. Just a really interesting delivery to the plate. It's like this uh, herky jerky uh, coming from different arm angle, uh, relying mostly on the slider. It's really fascinating to watch, but he had the Tigers totally perplexed. Is this just one of these things where, you know, the league has to figure him out and get a book? I don't know, but I was impressed enough to say, like, maybe he's not getting save chances, but he can vulture some wins. He can have some multi-inning outings with four strikeouts, whatever the case might be. But I was impressed enough in just that one appearance to say, hey, if you're in a deeper mixed league, you know, give it a shot. See where this story goes. For sure. Could there be signature significance to any relief appearance that has seven strikeouts in that small window? I think it's totally plausible. And that ties into my final pickup, which is a, a non-closing reliever, Joel Piomps of Milwaukee, who's not going to close. You know, Devin Williams is their closer, though maybe Piomps could get a look if anything happened to Williams. His fastball's crept into the 95 mile an hour range. His last 18 games, he has one walk and 24 strikeouts. That's it. That's all I need to see. He's getting high leverage work. It's mostly been holds but maybe that could percolate into some wins eventually. I think he's probably second line saves if Williams needs a day off or Williams would need any time on the IL. Bottom line, you, you have that walk strikeout rate working for you. And there's always these guys who come up. Piomps' career stats are kind of underwhelming. I get it. But relief pitchers, they can run hot and cold. They can figure things out. When I see this much of a sample with the walk and strikeout, I'm going to be interested in those medium and deeper mixed leagues. All right. So those are our recommendations for the week. I, I don't want to let you go without talking about something non-baseball. So, sure. uh, so Succession had its finale on, on Sunday. I'm not sure if you were a Succession watcher. Uh, Ted Lasso had a season finale, uh, just came out overnight. I'm wondering, Scott, one of you, if you could tell me some of your favorite series finales and what is a bad series finale? Okay, I think the – first of all, I am behind – I haven't watched any Secession or Ted Lasso even have been recommended to me. I'm currently re-watching yep. The Wire, which shows you how backwards mm -hmm. my life is. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable show, midway through season oh, yeah. four. And, and just, Great. Uh, I think it's – I'm not saying it's my favorite show of all time, although The Sopranos, Mad Men, and The Wire have a great one, two, three in some order as far as dramatic, dramatic television goes. The television is so much better today than it used to be. Yeah, But that's the smartest show I've ever seen. As far as finales, I think there's a gold medal. There's like a, a great answer, a canonical example of the classic finale. It's of a show that I thought was really good for the first two years and then kind of lost its way for a while. And that's Six Feet Under. It was a I five, knew you were going to say that. Yeah, five seasons. <laughs> five seasons on HBO. The first two seasons are incredible. The third season is okay. Fourth season is yeah. horrible. I, I, if you watch it, I don't think I'd even watch the fourth season. Fifth season makes a comeback, have some really good episodes near the end of the fifth season. And I don't want to spoil it. I know Six Feet Under was kind of a, a neat show, so a lot of people probably haven't seen it. I don't want to discuss what makes the show, so, what makes the finale so special. And, and even though the entire episode is good, it, it's really the way they stick the landing on the final yes. maybe 10 minutes of it. It's mm -hmm. unlike anything I've ever seen. It's to me, there's a lot of things I could consider for the the other two podium spots for the best finales ever as six feet under is always going to be my number one as for the worst finale for a show as great as seinfeld yeah i, th I thought their finale i don't know i i don't mind that they went out the way they did kind of with a quirky wrinkle of the nose of the audience but i would have redone that one 
I totally agree. There, and the thing about Seinfeld, I think before they showed the finale, there was a clip show. Well, you never see clip shows anymore. Remember there used to be clip shows? Oh, yeah. Sure. Uh, just to fill some time. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. So you get the clip show and then a finale, which was totally underwhelming and, and just out of step with everything else with the show. Like in Seinfeld, they could have just done a normal episode and be like, all right, that's it. Like I would have taken that. You know what I mean? I but, totally agree with you. But they didn't do that. Six Feet Under, I think, almost set the stage for like the era of prestige television in a way. Um, and I think the finale is kind of like the apex of what a finale could be. And I think a lot, I think it is a very influential show for other prestige filmmaking and television that we've seen since then. So and I'm not going to spoil it either, but the ending is brilliant. I was a big fan of the leftovers too. I think they stuck the landing uh, had similar showrunners as like Lost, which in which the total mess. Uh, that show was a total mess. The finale was a mess. Uh, it was a little better finale in that one. I think the Wire finale is uh, great as well. Uh, but a lot of HBO we're talking about here, but uh, or Max as they call themselves. And I think I think Succession did a, a great job with their finale too. I'm not going to spoil it either, but I was very satisfied. And we should also say like the role that music plays in evoking the emotion from the viewer. It's such a key component of uh, Mad Men, Succession, and what we're mentioning with uh, Six Feet Under. The music is such a key part of it. Yeah, the music in Six Feet Under is incredible. And I know a lot of the genre of the music they play are stuff that is in my wheelhouse and is in your wheelhouse as, as well. David Chase's musical choices for The Sopranos were always outstanding. Mm -hmm. Mad Men has incredible music and is, is such a a smart time uh, time period piece. I thought the Better Call Saul uh, finale was really good. I like how that ended. I wasn't sure I was going to have a satisfying ending to Better Call Saul. No, Mad Men. I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't crazy about their final season. I thought it was yeah. fine. Um, yeah. The thing about Mad Men is that I don't think the last episode is particularly satisfying, other than the absolute end of it, where they yeah. come up with I think a perfect way to end that show and to wrap it up. Where do you come down on? The Sopranos ending because it was controversial. It's an unbelievably important show, Titanic show. Not yes. everybody liked the ending. Not everybody was even yeah. convinced the show ended. Did, did somebody just unplug the television? What just happened? <laughs> I yeah. think it's clear that Tony Soprano has died. There's been a lot of breakdown of what actually happens. Every time right. the bell rings, they're showing Tony's point of view. So when right. it goes black for seven or eight seconds, he's obviously does his point of view is that he's dead. But right. uh, how do you feel about the Sopranos ending? I was angry at the time, <laughs> I remember, because uh, you know you had the car backing up into the spot. Yeah. Meadow, and Meadow, Camp, of, like, Meadow Camp Parallel we, Park. We learned yeah, that. Yeah, just a lot of a lot of tension. You're like sweating in that moment. Like, what's going to happen? I think everyone watching that moment was anticipating something terrible to happen. You know what I kept doing is I kept pausing the, the program to see this, they're wrapping this up in four minutes. They're wrapping this up in two minutes and thirty seconds. I wanted to see how much yeah. time was left because I didn't yeah. seem like there's enough time to maneuver. What I, th I thought they were going to do a lot more than what they did. And, and look, David Chase right. is one of his favorite, I, I pardon me for cutting you off here. One of, one of his favorite things to do, like in a season is a lot of times that the penultimate episode of a season would be the explosive one. And then the last episode of a season would, you know, he wouldn't have the fireworks show then. And he said, right. look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you all the answers. I'm not going to end it with a fireworks show. He, he was such a subtle filmmaker, which is really what that is. It, you know, the Sopranos is filmmaking as much as his television. So I get that he wanted to go out the way he did, but still, as I, I'm with you with the tension where I, I couldn't believe that as the show was winding down, that they had such limited time to maybe do some of the things I was hoping they were going to do. I think another one of the worst finales that a lot of people talk about is Dexter as well. I watched a little bit of that show, but remember they brought it back, I think a couple of years ago to kind of give their hardcore fans a little bit more of a satisfying ending Breaking Bad, I think, is another one. I, I, I assume if you watch Better Call Saul, you probably yep, watch Breaking sure. Bad. Uh, I I liked the finale in the sense that it loose ends were tied up, but it was a little too neat given how the show went up until that point. You weren't expecting a happy ending, and it kind of was the best happy ending that you could get, if that makes sense. You know, Breaking Bad is a show I have great respect for, but I don't 
I don't love it the way everybody else loves it. I, I've only seen it once. I don't think I'm ever going to watch it again because I think some of the tension in the show is a little bit manufactured. Some of the grandiose speeches that people give, I don't know. It, it seems to me, I, I'm not, I was talking about this with my colleague, Frank Schwab lately, uh, recently, great Yahoo, Yahoo colleague who covers everything, mostly the NFL over at Yahoo. I'm not saying Better Call Saul is better than Breaking Bad, but I, Better Call Saul is more my speed, is more my jam than Breaking Bad. I would put it that way. I have not watched all of Better Call Saul yet, so I, that's probably my next uh, my my next project is to watch that. Might might have to wait until the baseball off season, but uh, looking forward to catching up on that one because now I don't have Succession anymore. And I'll I give you another great it. finale. It's 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 a non finale finale because. My so-called life only ran for one season mm -hmm. because they they thought they were going to do multiple seasons, and Claire Danes didn't want to do the show anymore. And right, the final episode of the first season is incredible, and the, the yeah. that show is so good. We're talking about great music too, man. The music yep. choices are unbelievable, and you can just see how much the acting chops that Claire Danes had at such a young age. But it's a high school show where the kids look like high schoolers a lot of times. Yeah, you know, like like I love Grease and everything, but everybody in that movie looks like they're thirty three years old. Sure, you know, yeah. Um, 90210 was the contrast for during sure. that time where I yeah. think there were 40 year olds in that. Yeah, in and, that and, Andrea Zuckerman was, you know, was <laughs> getting social security and, and playing a high school student. It doesn't make any sense. But um, my so called life was so smart and nuanced and subtle. And and the kids had real great. problems and they looked like high school kids. Also, you want to see a great show. You want to talk about a show ahead of its time. I don't think this finale was anything special, although the season one finale was unbelievable. But um, what am I thinking? The White Shadow. A basketball mm. show in the late seventies and early eighties. Uh, the late Ken oh. Howard played a a former NBA player who was white who goes to an inner city high school in LA that is l largely black and uh, coaches the team. Unbelievable show, very smart. Really? And you know the kids don't always have satisfying. The, the episodes didn't always have satisfying endings, and they, they dealt about everything. You know, they, they dealt about every every hot topic you could think of, but it didn't pander to you. It actually played to your intelligence. It, uh, Bruce Paltrow was the executive producer, Gwyneth Paltrow's dad. Interesting. And I've never seen that. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The White Shadow is so, so, so smart and good. And I want to say that the guy who played Salami – uh, was Vince Van Patten, who, who people probably know because he's been uh, a producer and a director of several important shows, including The Sopranos. He was one of the main Sopranos guys under David Chase, and uh, Vince Van Patten is um, just a great man. Uh, as other people on that cast went on to be directors also. So there's a lot of – it's just a smart show. And I, I awesome. can't imagine anybody who likes smart TV could watch The White Shadow and be like, oh, man, this uh, this is so far ahead of its time. You know what's funny? I loved the show Cheers, although I think Cheers breaks up into three very easy pieces, right? Right. With Coach, it's fantastic. Through Diane leaving, it's still good. And then once Kirstie Alley, uh, rest in peace, comes on board, you know, Sam becomes one note. Cliff becomes one. Cliff was kind of always one note. The characters become a lot more narrow. The writers ran out of things to write about. Mm -hmm. I still watched it, but I love the. To me, it's you know, it's great. It's good, and then it really falls off. I don't remember. The finale all that well other than i remember the final scene i thought was satisfying uh, yeah. what did, did you watch cheers and what did you think of the finale i i watched the finale i remember when i was a kid i can't remember your like details about the finale i watched the first couple of seasons of cheers after my second daughter was born and i had a lot of like late evenings of like holding a baby and it was very good for that purpose just to get like 20 minutes of the show uh, so it was really satisfying to go back to watch those episodes with like a new appreciation for them. Uh, it's something I want to get back to, even though I know that the show kind of goes a bit downhill, but, uh, I do know that I watched the finale. Uh, I don't remember great details about it though. Two other things I'm going to mention the new heart finale. I, I was not a diehard new heart fan by any means, but I know what happens in the finale and it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it's good. It's, it's, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil it. And, um, one other thing I wanted to mention about The Wire that's so great. Every season of The Wire has a different theme to it. Yes. And the final the season, the theme is, is the newspapers. And mm -hmm. the final episode is called is Dash 30 Dash, which is a little inside joke to um, – inside nod to anybody who's worked in newspapers. When your story is over, when you transmit your story and you want to make it clear to your editors that you've sent everything you've wanted to send, you put a Dash 30 Dash. That just means right. the story's over. And so I just yeah. thought that was cool. This, again, that's – 
I'm not saying The Wire is the best TV show ever, though it might be. It's so smart. It's a smart. Yeah. I can't think of a show that has that much nuance in the cast. Everybody feels like the right casting choice. Oh yeah. Secondary and tertiary characters get arcs. You get to know them. The mm -hmm. bad guys can be likable. The good guys can be unlikable. It's, it's not really clear who the good guys are sometimes. Sometimes the bad guys are the good guys and the good guys are the bad guys. It's, it's an amazing, amazing program. Season four is the one with the kids in the school and yes, stuff, yes, right? It is. Uh, yeah. That season is the one that like got me to like put it over the edge to say like this is one of the best shows I've ever seen. Um, so much going on, all the political talk and, and all yeah. the maneuvering. You know, It's an election year and, and everybody's looking for a seat before all the seats are taken and who's going to align with who. And it's one of these shows where it's like two people can seem like they're opposite, so they don't get along or they're not aligned, and then they find themselves in an alliance. It's weird some of the choices that people make. And again, yeah. I, I love The Sopranos could do this. It can make the good guys seem like bad guys and the bad guys seem like good guys because people are complicated, right? Yeah. Think of the most interesting people in life. They're usually contradictions, you know? And that's I think The Wire right. understands that. Um, very, very smart. It went out in five seasons. The producers, the showrunners said, you know, we've said everything we have to say, you know, it was never widely popular with ratings when no. it came out. Um, I don't know. I, I I think it might be the best TV show ever. I think it's certainly up there. And maybe we do a draft at some point of that as well. Uh, we'll save that for a future week. But very good stuff, Scott. Thanks so much. Remember to subscribe to Circling the Bases wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, be sure to rate and review if you like what you're hearing, you can also rate the show on Spotify. I could use some help there as well. Follow us on Twitter if you don't already. Scott is at Scott underscore Piotowski on Twitter. I'm at DJ Short. Take care, everyone, and we will see you next time.